It's going to, some, some of the things I'm going to say is going to be kind of direct. But you know what? It's all going to be for the benefit of the believer, for the benefit of our body. And so um, let's walk with this together. Let's turn to the book of Joel. If you haven't found it already, um, I'm going to walk through a little bit. The, the Joel is broken down kind of into two parts. You've got the first part of the story here, the prophecy of Joel. Um, the verse 1 of Joel, it says, The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about Joel. Um, but we know he was somebody that heard from God and he spoke God's words. So in uh, the first part of Joel, it, you can break it down the book into two parts. The first part is chapter 1 going through verse uh, chapter 2, verse 27. And, and in this first part, it talks about these plagues of locusts that, ha that have come. It talks about judgment being from God. And then it, it begins to turn in the second uh, chapter that the people repented. They, they, they rend their hearts, it says. They changed their hearts. They repented. And, and then it tells this beautiful story. We'll see today this beautiful story of God's restoration. That it restores these things that the locusts have eaten and, and destroyed in their lives. And then it goes to the second part, the 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 28, through the end. And it talks about what I get excited about, I think everybody gets excited about, is this outpouring of God's Spirit. And then another section where it, it kind of ends with this judgment, this decision day, this judgment for those that have rejected him. For those who have received him and called in his name, they, there's this promise of the Spirit that's, that's coming and is going to pour out upon them. And then there's also this same, in the same breath, there's also a time where the judgment of the Lord comes for those who reject him. And so I want to focus the main um, part of the message. I'm going to go through these first two sections kind of uh, as a little survey. And then I'm going to bring home um, main points at the end. Uh, because I believe it's, there's something that God wants to communicate to us. Right? It's, it's, it's fun doing Bible study. But I, I'm like, I want to be somebody that, that, that we receive something that we can do something different today. Right? Uh, so we're going to work on that together. So first is this terrible locust plague. Um, the word of the Lord came to Joel, and, and we don't know much about him, but that he was willing to be used as a mouthpiece uh, for God and not for himself. And in verses 2 and 3, it describes that this story, the words of this prophecy, is going to be passed on from generation to generation as an encouragement, as a reminder that, that, that these words had come from the Lord. And verse 4, it begins to describe this catastrophe of the locusts that are coming. And it says this, let's read this together. In verse 4 it says, The cutting locusts left, and the swarming locusts had eaten. What the swarming locusts left, the hopping locusts had eaten. And what the hopping locusts had left, the destroying locusts had eaten. And so we get this picture, and Joel begins to describe that there's this picture that these locusts have come, and there's destruction and, and devastation and catastrophe everywhere. The result was utter devastation. It goes on to describe this that verse 5, it says that the wine was cut off from the drunkard because the, the vineyard had all been destroyed, that the fig tree had dried up, and that it had splintered, and that there was no grain left in the land, not only to eat, but, but no grain even to offer to the Lord uh, as an offering to, to him in celebration of who God is. In verse 13, it continues that Joel begins to call for Israel to call out to the Lord. Now I hope this is uh, for you today, that you don't get to the point where everything is utterly destroyed yes. before you call out on the Lord. And maybe this is, this is a heating for us this morning, that hey, you don't have to wait till that end point, like at, at any point, <laughs> and we'll see this at any, in the scripture, at any point during this time, if they would have turned their hearts towards God, and he would have changed. And I love this about God. Mm -hmm. I love this about God. In this story, God is the one that brought this judgment. He brought the destruction to the people of Israel. Man, you sound really happy about that. Why? <laughs> Jesus, the, the main one, we'll see this later, that, that God does this so that they would turn to him. 
And sometimes the situation that we're going through in our life, I, I believe that we, and, and I'm not doing this to contradict what we just spoke, there is a real enemy, and there is a real stronghold of an enemy that, that comes against our soul and our spirit. But sometimes the situations that we're going through is because we have turned our hearts away from God, and it's actually God resisting us so that we turn to Him. And this is what Joel begins to describe here in verse 13. Joel calls on Israel to cry out to the Lord because he sees the catastrophe as judgment. He sees that the, the situation in him, the, the mess that he's in, the, the mess that all the vineyards are in, he, he saw that not just as an enemy working in his life, but know that God is actually judging me because I went, we went our own way. This catastrophe of the locusts is a foreshadowing of the day of the Lord to come. It's the beginning of the warning of the judgment of the day of the Lord. Look here, it says that let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming and it is near, a day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Joel, again, after he describes this, this day of darkness coming, this day of the Lord, this day of judgment, he again describes the locusts and how terrible they were. Right? He, he says that the, they were like a raging army of horses and warriors. Right? That just sounds that sound destructive. In verse 3 of chapter 2, it says that they devoured everything. They were a desolate wilderness and nothing could escape the locusts being eaten. The city was, was full of them. The walls were crawling with them. The houses were full of them. They would come into the, to the windows like thieves. And, and I would say that, to, uh, as I'm saying that in, in this description, I would say that we can't escape from God's purposes in our life. In verse 11, they were exceedingly great, and he... God, uh, sorry, he that executes God's word is powerful. Describes here, when God brought judgment on his people, it was powerful. It was great. It was mighty. And nothing could stop it. No human thing could stop it. No effort of our own flesh could stop it. To this point, we see God fighting for his people for some reason. And he threatened that the end was near. So I had a question and pause at that point. Is destruction what God has in mind for his people? And I would answer a large and emphatic no. Destruction is not what God has for his people. But let's look here at verse 12 through 14. It says this, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. God's goal, God's purpose in this destruction was never for the destruction of his people. The goal in his judgment towards us and the judgment toward the Israelites was never for our destruction and our defeat. The purpose in all of this was so that we would turn to him and be, what does it say? It says that we would be blessed. We turn to him and be blessed. There's a hard thing going on in my life. There's a, there's a judgment going on. I, I've made some decisions on my own, away from what God wants. And all of a sudden I'm reaping the unfortunate consequences of, of those decisions. And those unfortunate consequences, the, that judgment from the Lord, that's God's resistance to us. So that we would turn to him. This is described also in Romans. We go about our own thing in Romans chapter 1 and 2. We go about our own thing and, and we find it not satisfying to us. And, and we get more sinful and we get more perverted. And we go further away from the Lord. And, and it says in Romans 2 that God allows this to happen. 
Why so? Because when we get to that point of judgment, we see how good God was. That's right. We're reminded, and we turn to him, oh Lord, forgive us that we would ever make it about somebody else instead of about you. Even with the threat of destruction, he holds an opportunity to repent, even in the last hour. I love how Joel described it. It's near. The judgment is near. It's like upon me. I, I can feel it. It's there. But God, even in that moment, says, repent. Turn to me, and I'll make things whole. If they rend their hearts, God would cease to rend their land. Right? This is even in other prophecies. Right? If we would humble ourselves and seek His face, what? He would heal their land. Joel calls to the priest in this moment to fast, pray, humble themselves, and repent. And in verse 18, I love the way God responds. Verse 18, it says that the Lord became jealous for his land. I love the Bible describing God as jealous. He wants our affection. He's jealous for us. He desires a relationship with us. He desires to have our, our whole heart. He desires to be uh, within us and for our eyes to be his and his alone. Why do we see this, or how do we see this? In 19, uh, verse 19 through 27, we see a, a description of a stunning restoration of the people of God. All right, let's look at this together. Joel chapter 2, verse 19 through 27, it says, The Lord answered and said to his people, they had already, they humbled themselves, they turned to him. All right, he, he answers people. The Lord answered and said, Behold, I am sending to you grain, oil, and wine, and you will be satisfied. And I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner from you. I will drive him into the parched and desolate land, his, his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, and he has done great things. So he has accomplished the purpose. The judgment that God sent had accomplished his purpose. Then it says in verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pasture of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and its vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindiction. He has poured down you abundant rain, and early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, and that shall overflow with wine and oil. I'll restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, the, the, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of your Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no one else. And my people shall never be put to shame again. Beautiful picture of restoration. I mean, it's like, it's like two stories. You flip the page, right? One side being darkness, one side being desolate, destruction, uh, want and need. And the second side, they turn to God. And in that moment, blessing flows into their life. I love it. When we draw near to God, He draws near. He, we get all good things. Man, when we draw near to the Lord, He restores us. That's what that picture is. All these, all these grain everywhere, the, the flowing of, of, the, of the wine. It's all for this thing, that we will eat in plenty and be satisfied. And we'll praise the name of the Lord. God desires undivided allegiance. God desires our whole heart. Right? He's a gentleman wanting our whole heart. Again, it, how do we see this? It says this, that you shall know that I, Yahweh, am your God, and there is no one else. 
You try to go your, you try to go your own way. You try to get meet your own needs in your own way, away from God's way and God's plan. All of a sudden, you 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 go that way, and, and what you thought would bring success and what you thought would bring bring plenty actually leaves you in want and in need because you you're actually now facing the judgment of God because He had a way for you and you chose another way, right? And so now you go to God, even though it looks like it's going to require more of me. Now it's going to I want to receive a blessing because. I'm in union with the Father. I'm in union with Him. I mean, I've made the right way. Apparently, we don't know exactly what the people, the people of Israel and, and Joel were were facing. We don't know what decision they made. What it doesn't describe that. But it was it's apparent that their affection had wandered. That he that God no longer was their all-consuming love. It, he was no longer their all-consuming supplier. He wasn't their all-consuming provider. They were, they were going their own way. And it was dishonoring to God. This isn't described just in Joel. I mean, even in Revelation chapter 3, right? It says that, it is, it, that God desires our whole heart. He doesn't desire that we, if we're lukewarm, if we're half-hearted in this, man, he's going to spew us out. The day of the Lord was near. Joel says that in uh, chapter 1, verse 15, and 2, verse 1, and, and also 2, verse 11. So what became of it? Jesus, God now, they turn to God, their hearts have been rended, and, and God now restores their land. What becomes of this day of the Lord? And verse 28 is this powerful uh, verses, this powerful prophecy. It says that it shall come to pass afterwards, after this restoration has happened, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young man shall see vision, even on the male and the female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. I love this. You know why? Because that includes everybody. There, there's nobody left out from God's blessings of restoration. There's nobody left out from the Holy Spirit's outpouring in our life. Uh, young, old, you know, uh, one nation, another nation, one tribe, another tribe, uh, no matter your position, your CEO or servant, wherever you are, says, this is for you. This is for, your heart is turned towards God, you call it, in, and this is for you, that he will pour out his spirit on us. Joel sees an overflow of spiritual blessings, not just physical blessings. And this benefit comes in verse 32 to who? It comes, it shall come to pass, verse 32, to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. It comes to pass to all those who call on the name of the Lord. But as this blessing flows, the day of destruction also exists as well. In verse 30 through 32, right before that, it describes this dark and gloomy day. The blood will turn uh, dark. There will be um, fire, and there will be columns of smoke, and the, and the earth and the heavens will show wonders, and, and this destruct, destruction is, is, is still at the forefront as we see the outpouring of the Spirit at the same time. That there is a terrible time of judgment that's coming. And in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, there's described Jehoshaphat. Let's read that. For behold, in those days, I will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. And I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means Jehovah judges. And in verses 12 through 14, it describes a multitude in this valley of decision. I've grown up in the church, and I've heard sermons on this. I've even been to prayer meetings talking about this valley of decision, that there are people in the middle of decision, and they're... And they're uh, which way should they go? And so we pray, God, that you would bring life, and that God, you would, you would, and that the people in those valley of decision, that, that God, you would rescue them, and you would save them. Well, here in this scripture, in, well, they're talking about this people uh, uh, in this valley of decision, 
this valley of destruction, this valley where it describes the day of the Lord is coming, that there's a chariot coming, there's a war that's coming, God is the one that is the decider. The decision that is made, the deciding factor in this point, the decision is virtually, it means judgment. They're in the valley of judgment. They're in the valley of decision. God has made the decision to bring judgment. So Joel looked to the future. The destruction has come. The judgment came. The, the people of God, they, they rendered their hearts. They, they turned towards God. And he sees two different futures for the people. He sees one, salvation and blessing for those that call the name of the Lord. Yes. Spiritual blessings, physical blessings, it's all described here. And at the same time, he sees judgment and destruction for the people who go their own way. Verse 16 through 21, let's read that the closing uh, parts of the scripture. The Lord, verse 16, chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy. And strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the stream, the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and the water, the valley of Shittim. There's this picture here, again, that the Lord comes on this day, and those who are in destruction, those who have chosen their own way, they will be met by God, by the Lord, as a roaring lion. For those who have been uh, submitted to the Lord and have been saved, they will be met by the refuge of delight. The Lord, the Lord is either a roaring lion from Zion or a refuge to his people. The first half ends with the same emphasis that it ends in the second half. Both parts of the book of Joel are, are ended by this same statement. In verse in chapter 2, verse 27, it says that the reason why these things have come about is that you shall know, in verse 27, you shall know that I am your Lord God and there is none else. In chapter 3, verse 17, it again ends this, ends this a portion with the verse that it says, So you shall know, in view of all that happened, in view of the, the blessing that flow, in the view of the judgment that came, in view of that, you shall know that I am the Lord your God. The purpose of God's movement in our lives whether it be resistance that brings judgment, or whether, it be, or whether it be blessings that flow from salvation, the purpose of all of this is the same. That we would know that He alone is God, and is to be loved, worshipped, served above every other thing. So the blessings that we receive in God. So now when our, our vats are full and the joy of the Lord overflows and the Holy Spirit begins to move on us and we begin to dream dreams and see visions and, and speak on His behalf and we have this union with the Father. The reason why those things exist is so that we know that He alone is God. That He is to be loved and worshipped, served above all things. When judgment comes and there's the resistance of God, the reason why it's there is so that we would know that He alone is God and He is to be loved and worshipped, served, and, and worshipped above all other things. Here's the message of Joel to the people of Israel. 
And I thought in closing, there, there's four points that I'm like just like excited about that I see that would apply to our lives. One is this reminder that God's purpose in the world is to be God alone in all the world. That's his purpose. I was reading a, a book recently, uh, Francis Chan came out with a new book, Letters to the Churches. And in that, he, he again, I, I wrestle with this all the time. Last week, I, I talked about wrestling with our Sunday morning gatherings. Like, should we have this greeting time or not have this greeting time? And, and I pulled a whole bunch of people, and they said 50-50. Some people love it, some people don't, right? And, and, and Terrence just has this way of speaking sometimes really directly. And in, and in his book, he talks about making all things holy, all things for God. And he basically slaps me in the face and slaps others in the face that's still trying to wrestle, wrestle with this. He said, it doesn't matter which way or what you do. It, it shouldn't matter what people would say or what people would like. He says, all of this should be for God and, and God alone. So why do we come on Sunday mornings and sing a, a few good songs? Why do we greet? Why do we worship? Why do we spend our time in our word? Because God is God alone. And he is to be loved. Worshipped, served, above all things. May that be in this new year a purpose of ours. Secondly, I, I see in this is that if our hearts wander, God will fight us to bring us to repentance. If our hearts wander, you can expect God's resistance. This isn't a, a, a harsh punishment. It's desire to have communion with us. God will fight us so that he can bring us back to himself. So that we may be blessed. That's for somebody this morning. I, I, every, time I, every time I wrote that, wrote that um, point in my message this morning, I said, man, there's somebody that needs to hear that. That you're, you're, you're feeling resistance in your life and you've been blaming it on the enemy's attacks and it's really just you've got, been going the wrong way and God's been trying to get your attention to bring you back to what he has for you and it's something better for you than what you're in. The third thing I, I see is that we should rend our hearts and not our garments. Right? That we have to have true repentance. This whole study of the gospel, what it's all about is it is that we would, we would change our hearts to believe fully on God. Some of us in this room, it's not just about, uh, oh, being sorrowful. Oh, man, now I know that God has been resisting me. Oh, I'm sorry, God. I, I, I'm crying now. I want to wear sackcloth and ashes. I want to be low and mourning. No, it, it is not about the outward expressions of our repentance. God is desiring that our hearts would change, that we would believe on Him. Believe on Him for our salvation. Believe on His way that is better than the way that we've chosen on our own. Believe on Him. Rent our hearts, not our garments. And the fourth thing that I, that I see in this passage is that we should pray and seek God for the outpouring of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the middle of this judgment, <clears throat> what is Joel, what was Joel's instruction? Pray. 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 Seek God. Seek Him. Call on His name. There is an outpouring of the Spirit that comes in the last days. And God desires it for us. He wants us to be close with Him. He wants us to walk. He wants us that every day, every Sunday, every gathering we come together, us be able to say, man, God was doing something in my life. That we should have every Sunday, we should have a line of people saying, man, this is what God's been speaking to me. Man, this is what the Word of God has been showing me. Man, Andrew, Pastor Andrew, did you know I had this dream last night? And here's what it was. This is a dream from God. I had this vision, and this is from God. I, I was speaking the other day to my coworker. It was from God. That's the, that's the norm. That's the norm for God's people. So if anything, the first one is that we should know that God's purpose in the world is to be known as the one true God. Secondly, if our hearts wonder, we can expect God will fight us to bring us to repentance. 
Third is that we should render our heart, we should change our heart. It's not an outward repentance. It's not a physical thing that need to change our heart, that need to believe fully on Him. And fourth, man, we should be praying. God, send your Holy Spirit. God, I want your Holy Spirit. I want all that you have for me. And Joel just describes it. He wants to answer that prayer. Anyone who calls on his name, to anybody who calls on him, will receive it. Tomorrow I want to invite you to stand with me. And this is a this is a new year. This is hey, Andrew, this is a hard word on a new year. No, it's a good word. God has some promises for us. That's what I, I hope you guys received this morning. With. And he has some promises for us. He has some blessings. He has some restoration. If you're on the one side and you're saying, yeah, I can feel God's resistance. Well, guess what? It can end. You know, like, that's the message this morning is it can end. The hard thing can end. The part of it is that we call on his name. See? This morning, I want to pray over you. And I'm encouraged by Kevin's prayer over you. I want to pray over us as a body. That we would seek after Him, we would turn to Him, and we would receive all that He has for us. But I also want to encourage you to take five minutes before we leave, and to respond. To make a place of prayer, whether it be at your seat or here at the altar. And let's pray. Let's seek God. In this room, he said, Yeah, I gotta make things right. I, I understand, yeah, that, that's not just the enemy, it's it is God resistance. I need to make my heart right with God. I pray that you take some time, let's make our hearts right with God. Right? <clears throat> you're here this morning, you say, God, I just want your Holy Spirit. I want your Spirit. I'm gonna pray. Now let's take five minutes to respond, whether it be at your seat or here at the altar. I'll be here. I can pray with you if you'd like me to pray with you. Let's take a moment and, and heed Joel's word. Heed the word of the Lord this morning. Seek me. Come to me. Let's pray. Father, I am grateful this morning for your word. I'm, I'm grateful for the interruption to the normal scheduled program to hear from you. That God, there may be resistance in our life, and it, it, it's not from the enemy, it's from you, because you desire us to come to you. You desire us to turn back to you. You desire us to seek after you. And God, we love, I, I love this picture in Joel, that, that not only is there destruction because of judgment, but God, there is just this picture of plenty. God, abundance. Oh, your spirit flowing when we turn our hearts towards you. So Father, I just pray now in the next five minutes as we take a moment to pray, as we take a moment to seek you, Father, I pray that our hearts would be turned towards you. Father, that forgiveness would flow, that repentance would flow. And Father, we would receive all that you have for us. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're here this morning, I just want to encourage you for the next five minutes. It's, it's 20 after, it's so about 10. Five minutes, I'll come back up, but... Take some time, pray at your seat, pray here, speak to the Lord.